Welcome to Sociology 227, Pierre Bourdieu, Video 1. In this video, I've got three tasks. First, I'm going to tell you about Bourdieu's life, what he was trying to do in his academic career. Next, I want to look to some of the main concepts that are flowing throughout that career. And finally, I want to get you ready to do the readings, where we'll put those concepts to work. Savvy students will realize that we're not reading the OG this week. Rather, we're reading a secondary source. Why? Jenkins' paper is incredible. I love it. Secondly, reading Borgia directly is kind of like reading a love letter from Max Weber to Max Weber. It's brutal. So, for those reasons, we're reading Tanya Jenkins. Let's do it. Here we have Pierre Borgia. As you can see, he has a very French look on his face. Borgia is an interesting character because of his origins. He's born in the middle of nowhere, the son of a postman. As he entered the world of academic life, he was always immediately interested in how class differences manifested in the thought and actions of people around him. France's education system is highly regimented, with a whole lot of very strict examinations to determine where you rank in the system. Borgia himself does very well, eventually finding himself at the highest rank of the French academic system, at the École Normale Supérieure. If you recall, this is where Foucault went as well, being supervised there by one Louis Althusser. Even though he's of humble class origins, and was never made to forget this, Bourdieu must adopt the mannerisms of the French academic class. Based on his horrendously pretentious academic writing style, suffice it to say that he succeeded. Bourdieu does his obligatory military service in Algeria, and takes a keen interest into how the Kabyle Berbers deal with France as a colonial power. What's important here for us is that Bourdieu takes questions of class and capitalism as central to his analysis of society, but also that it is empirical and ethnographic. That is, he actually follows people around. Unlike many of the people we've observed then, Bourdieu's analysis of the social structure takes place by observing it directly, rather than simply through document analysis, reading through stats, etc. The practice of sociology, then, is rooted in direct observation. I think three things are important here. One, an interest in class. Two, an interest in education and reproducing a legitimate vision of the world. And three, considering sociology as direct observational practice. Keep these three things in mind. Crucial to understanding what Bourdieu is trying to do is understanding how he fits into the agency structure debate. That is, by looking at objective and subjective social relations. This is an oversimplification, but think about a first-person account of social structure versus a third-person account. This will give you an idea of the positions of the two camps. We have two very different understandings of social relations going on. Not hard and fast, but each position shapes the kinds of questions that the thinkers pose. The first camp I want to call that interested in objective social relations. Here the interest is in understanding the basic facts of society, its social structure, to explain in part or in full the way its members act. Here I've placed Karl Marx and Durkheim as the chief members of this tradition. Why? Well, both through social facts and material conditions, they argue that we can answer pretty much every important question in society. Here the social is found in the way society is structured. These are questions with third-person answers. Why am I so poor? Structure. Why am I so fat? Structure. Structure, structure, structure. Marx's interest in structure comes in class, capital, and the social formation of value. Durkheim's interest in structure comes in the objective science of moral attachments. In both cases, the focus is on structures that determine action. We can contrast this camp with those that are focused on subjective social relations, or how people find meaning and interpret action. Here the actor is the unit of analysis, albeit one who receives direction and inspiration from the social order. So, we are more interested in why a particular person takes one form of action over the other. We want to ask questions about how the social comes to present a way of presenting oneself, of picking a particular commodity out of so many other options. Here it is individual and not collective behavior that needs to be explained. How do I manage myself around others if I interpret myself as overweight? Which frame do I apply to a particular object of scrutiny? Why do agents feel the way they do? Here we are focused on interpretation at all times. 
valuation, understanding, mindset. These are all first-person states, or at best, second. Weber's approach is subjective, looking into how we follow authority, legitimacy, and the social organization of rationality. Goffman's approach is subjective by following around interpersonal interaction and impression management. I want you guys to understand this in terms of agency and structure. Interpretive sociology seeks to explain agency as manifest in individual courses of action. Objective social science seeks to explain actions on a prevailing social structure that guides them. It is a science of social structure. Now, these are two poles rather than a strict division, but we can definitely see that the kinds of questions that we ask are vastly different based on the emphasis on structure or agency. Let me give you an example. And wear a coat, we're going north of Princess. Here's a screenshot documenting your instructor, Dr. Thomas Abrams, planning his usual uh, 10 a.m. trip to Big Bites to buy two hot dogs for the low, low price of $3. Back when you could do such things so easily. We'll focus on the ride, not the destination. We've already talked a bit about platforms like Uber in the Harvey video. So, what does an objective social scientist look to in explaining how Uber works? Marx would look at how labor is divided using Uber, how particular social conditions manifest in ride-sharing. Like Marx, Harvey would be interested in the way that neoliberal social relations continue to structure social arrangements, how they make obscene amounts of money for particular people at the expense of others. Durkheim would suggest that the kind of neoliberal social relations related to Uber show a developed society, how it addresses the needs of the social form. Smith is interested in the relations of ruling, the gendered position of the Uber driver, the costs borne by her or the partner at home. Sorry, I was thinking about those hot dogs. Let's look at the subjective side of things. However, we find a very different way of understanding social relations when we start to look at Uber from the position of so-called interpretive sociologists. These are the people who would look at the conscious choice of taking an Uber, how one manages impressions driving the car, or why one chooses to place themselves in such a precarious position in the economy, and for what reason. Weber would be interested in how one maintains order in a car that doesn't have the sanction of a company, and the choice to take an Uber over a cab. Irving Goffman is interested in how the Uber driver would manage your impression in order to ensure a five-star ride, in the kinds of conversations maintained in order to keep the show going. How does the cab structure change based on the type of client you engage with? What are the informal cues that you follow? Garfinkel is interested in how we do a routine cab ride in ways that we don't really express. Further, he's interested in the tacit nature of trust flowing through the experience and how one knows when things have gone awry and what one does when they do. This is crucial for understanding Bourdieu because he is trying to do both. He is trying to establish a sociology of position and disposition that looks at an objective position within the social structure, and also how we incorporate that objective position into the ways that individual actors make meaning and how individual actors navigate those moments. He's also interested in the class basis of consumption, like me eating trashy hot dogs. Three themes and related questions flow through Bourdieu's work. The first we've already come up against. Agency structure. How is it possible to address both individual motivations and collective action at once without dismissing one at the expense of the other. Here Bourdieu is in a long line of sociologists who want to ask how we can do exactly this. Talcott Parsons, for example, wanted to address situated action. He was, however, far less interested in applying this in particular locations. He wants a general theory of society, where Bourdieu is looking for an experientially situated theory of practice to be applied in places like education and to culture and consumption. This will come out in the example. Secondly, embodiment. Starting with Marcel Mauss, Durkheim's nephew, the sociology has been interested in the body as a site of social action and something that plays an active role in the kind of world we live in. For someone like Foucault, the body is usually shaped, molded, and manipulated in the way that a particular governing power desires. In this case, Bourdieu is closer to someone like Irving Goffman, who wants to see how the body-bound agent actively shapes their behavior because of that body. Bourdieu insists that we move from merely free-floating ideas and texts to the bodily styles that we use in all human conduct. Finally, the theme of reflexivity. 
Based on his own personal history, Bourdieu is interested in how the educational sphere reproduces itself in dominant class interests. In this sense, he is close to Marx. He is not close to Marx, however, insofar as he is interested in how social status and hierarchy are deployed by particular members to navigate the educational arena. So it isn't necessarily a sociology of oppression and exclusion, but one where particular actions, means, and bodies are admitted and others devalued. What's important is this. In each of the above cases, Bourdieu's sociology is one of position and disposition. How does social structure come to shape us, and how do we shape ourselves and our actions when we are situated there? Position and disposition. Remember that. Two central concepts in Bourdieu's thought are habitus and field. I think the most important concept we get from Bourdieu is habitus. You can get what the term comes from. Latin, for habit. Here Bourdieu is referring to a particular pre-reflexive disposition, a way of talking, of using one's body, and of acting that we present almost as second nature. For Bourdieu, habitus is an entry point to the world of agency and structure. Particular social structures have learned habits that demonstrate proficiency, not only in the ability to do something, but to do it in a recognized style. Here, for instance, we have Serena Williams and Roger Federer. The ability to play tennis requires we build particular habits. One can show one's mastery of the game of tennis in this bodily style. As one becomes more proficient at the game, you can perform them with flair or poorly, etc. These are the learned, acted-out dispositions that people must have in order to do and be proficient at tennis. What Bourdieu wants us to think about is the class basis of these dispositions. They are not distributed evenly, they are distributed unequally between different social groups. The second concept is field, the particular social space where these habits are learned, made meaningful, or deployed. When we think of habitus and field, and the difference between the two concepts, you can think of the court in which tennis is performed. It isn't solely a set of bounded rules that govern tennis, but also the surface on which tennis takes place in a material sense, of the type of pitch, etc., and in terms of the spectacle that others observe. Each field has a set of rules of the game that we follow. One is on the tennis field and one plays the game, yes, but here we must also think of the world of endorsements, the class pretensions that are accompanying the game, and the way that particular players are welcomed or not welcomed to the game. The Williams sisters, if you recall sports history, weren't welcome to participate fully in the game once they entered the arena. However, if one talks in terms of the proficiency, they were more than welcome. Here I want you to think about the two different concepts of agency and structure. When we look at the tennis court, Bourdieu is interested in how individual motivations are expressed through the structure of the game. The final crucial component of Bourdieu's thought that I'll cover in this video is the symbolic economy. Bourdieu does not simply look to economic capital as the basis of class. He expands it. To begin, we need to think in terms of commodities like Marx. Marx says the commodity is a social object produced by a relationally determined exchange value. It only has value insofar as it is worth something else. Bourdieu, and this is really important, takes Marx's understanding of capital and gives it multiple forms. Just as one can have a stock of capital, that is, a bunch of things that are worth money and you can spend how you wish, Bourdieu comes up with various types of capital, economic, social, cultural, and symbolic, that one mobilizes in particular arenas. So while Marx's capital only refers to various forms of material existence, as valorized under the economic relations of capitalism, commodities, Bourdieu wants to explore how the various types of capital relate to the various fields in which they operate, and how social structures and dispositions are shaped accordingly. So, one of the ways we can explore how various classes operate in the symbolic economy are on the particular goods people buy, and in the styles in which those things are consumed, explored, and cultivated. I'll give you another close-to-home example. Wine. Your boy likes wine. Bougie professors like myself drink wine and go to wine tastings because we're boring and need to show off our knowledge at all times. Wine consumption and wine knowledge is another area of symbolic struggle. Think about some of the corporeal styles involved in wine tasting. What sort of words get used to describe the wine? What happens when you order a bottle at the restaurant? How can you tell if a wine is good? 
We can treat the world of wine and the world of wine tasting as a symbolic economy, a particular field where you demonstrate competence through particular styles of the body, motions and ideas, and you can display prowess or incompetence in their performance. It isn't simply about having the means to enter a particular place or to afford it, but also the way that we deploy ourselves in that particular arena. What's important to note here is that there's nothing inherently fine about a particular wine, if we think about it in terms of the symbolic economy. Rather, the appreciation of wine, the techniques we use when we enjoy it or don't. This way of thinking is what shapes Bourdieu's big important book, Distinction, and how the French class structure was represented in the consumption of particular goods. Newspapers, for example. The idea that taste is socially organized really blew up the idea that the finer things in life are just that, finer than others. In short, cultural consumption itself is an example of position and disposition, where agency and structure come into contact and clash. The point is that taste is itself the outcome of social processes, and those processes just aren't measured in terms of income. Okay, I've made that point so far. Next, I want you to do the readings and see how symbolic struggle works out in clothing norms in the hospital. See you next video.